Hello, welcome to Unit 1 of Intro to Agroecology. This unit's entitled Current Non-Sustainable Agriculture Practices. What we'll be covering in this unit is what currently is happening in farming and why we need to make some changes uh, as we go into the future and able to, in order to be able to um, feed the population of uh, the world. Uh, here is just a picture of way back when of what the farming practices were like. And basically the reason this picture is here to show you how um, they used to plow the land and it was just all open all the time. You can see right now nothing's growing. Um, this would be in a dormant time probably in the late fall, winter, or early spring before we planted. And it's just to show you that that's what they used to do. And we'll talk as we go on in this uh, unit and discuss some of the changes we need to make. Um, some of the areas we're going to look at, we're going to look at the current practices um, that we currently do in agriculture. We're going to look at how we work the land, that's the tillage practices that we use currently. And we'll talk a little bit about um, from the beginning um, when they started out with the prairies and made them into farmland um, to today and, and the differences in philosophies and why they did that. Um, we're going to talk about synthetic fertilizers and why they have become an issue and why we need to change into organic fertilizers. We're going to talk a little bit about um, weed and pest control practices that are in use today um, that we use, and most of those are synthetic, um, not organic, and we'll talk about why we need to change those too. Um, we'll also talk about uh, a change that it used to be all small family farms, and it's becoming more and more as time goes on, um, large corporations doing the farming and raising the animals, and we'll talk about um, why that's been good and bad. And then we'll talk about some of the limitations we have with our current practices um, as we go forward in the future and why we need to change in order to be able to feed everyone. Um, the first area we'll talk about is the... Um, tillage practices that are in use today. Um, basically, um, when they had the native prairies, you had to, um, they called it busting the prairie, but you were actually taking a piece of equipment um, and making sure that it could dig into the land, and they used to do that every year. And we found out that in the practices of doing that, where we're losing some, uh, a lot of soil because of erosion, the winds in the wintertime, because it was open like that first picture we saw in this unit. Um, we're going to look at some of the different pieces they've used, um, current or they're currently using. Um, and we're going to talk a little bit about why did they change in, in, and uh, over the last 50 years into using new practices. One of the reasons they changed was because of the Dust Bowl they had, um, that they found out that the reason they had the Dust Bowl was because we were plowing and we were leaving the fields open and uh, prone to being able to have erosion. The wind was blowing the soil everywhere uh, except where you wanted it to be. Um, then we're going to look also at some of the conservation things that they've come about probably starting in the late 60s, early 70s to today. Um, and why did they, why are they practicing it? And why is the farm bureaus that are out there helping people, uh, helping the current farmers learn that they need to change what they're doing? Uh, and then up to the current where we're pretty much now, most farmers are believing that no-till is the way they should do versus breaking the prairie or using the plow all the time. Um, there's a lot of farmers that don't even have plows anymore. But basically what the no-till is, is they've changed when they plant. They've added um, some equipment to it that makes them able to plant and, you know, open the ground a little bit. But we're doing it a lot less than what we did. And it's um, actually uh, saving uh, the land that we have. Um, some of the current uh, tillage methods that we have, um, there's cultivation, um, and what cultivation is, is after the plants are planted, they go in there and they try to control the weeds. So they can do that up to a certain point. Um, let's just, it doesn't matter whether it's corn or soybeans, the two most common crops that are out there for most farmers. Um, it's just a little, they call it a chisel plow. It's a V-shaped piece of equipment. 
And what happens is it just goes between the rows of the crops, whether it's corn or soybeans, and it actually um, pulls the weeds out of the ground. You can only do that till it gets about a foot high, but then at that point, the crop tends to crowd out um, the ability for the sun to get to the ground, which is how seeds germinate for weeds, and you don't have that problem anymore, or certainly not as much. Um, plowing is the first time when you do it. If you've never farmed land, or if you had it, let's say in pasture land, or it was just fallow, which means you don't have any crops on it at all, that um, you might have to work it with a plow uh, in order to be able to plant again. Disking is a practice that's not used as much anymore, but basically it used to be used all the time in the 60s and 70s that they go in right before they planted. It's a round shaped saucer and there's a bunch of them hooked on. We'll have a picture of it later uh, to see it. And basically it would, it would uh, turn the ground a few inches in and provide for the ability to be able to plant easy. Um, minimum till was when you would do it um, not as often, they got to a point where they, they did not at the end of the year when they took the crops out, the crop residue was there. They used to always either come in and disc it or they turn it with a plow for the winter time and then they come in and disc in the spring and you'd be able to plant and they'd have a smooth surface to plant on. Now what they do is they leave that residue, a lot of what they found out will go away in the winter time from the freeze thaw cycles. Uh, and then there's now no-till when they started adding that uh, extra, just a little disc actually, it'll just open the soil enough to put the seed in the ground and that's what they call no-till. So it's technically, it is a little bit of tilling, but it's not as much as it was when you used to do the disking. Um, <clears throat> um, on this slide, this just goes to the stuff I said about cultivation, plowing and disking. Um, it talks a little bit more detail for the cultivation, removing those weeds, and it, um, why does it create a better growing environment? Because if there's less um, competition for the plants, the plants are gonna do better. They're all competing for, <coughs> excuse me, all the nutrients and water. So the less plants that are there and the ones that you want that are there, they're gonna grow better for you. Um, plowing, it'll dig down in 10 to 12 inches so you can see um, that digging down that far, how you're opening up a, a big area when it turns over, and you'll see a picture of it in a little bit, that that's what allows for that erosion when the wind comes to have it blow around. Um, pretty much now, it's only used when you're preparing a new field. Um, disking, told you before, it's a platter-like device. Uh, it only goes in four to six inches, and it really doesn't turn it like a plow. It just kind of cut, cuts it apart because of how the disk is. And basically, when there are some farmers that still do it, they'll do it at the end of harvest to, to break apart the corn or soybean residue that's there. Um, and basically, corn fields are what they use it in. The soybeans don't leave as much residue, okay? Uh, some farmers still use it for when they plant a new crop because that's what they've always done. We all get in habits. The minimum till is that um, disc in a field before you plant, but you don't ever use plowing at all. Um, and I would say most farmers are either in minimum till or no till. Um, I'd say vast majority, probably 90 to 95% today across the US. Um, no till is when they don't use the, um, the disc or plow and they go ahead and harvest, plant and harvest without doing that. But once again, the planter that they use has a little disc on it that opens it up enough that you can plant the seed in the ground. Um, here's a picture of disking, and you can see it's pretty, <clears throat> it's not completely smooth, but in, in the next picture you're going to see um, the reason you do this is it opens it up, but what it also does is it also allows for um, seed, seeds to come up for weeds, which would allow more weeds to come up, and that's part of the thing too when you do the no-till, you're not going to get as many uh, weed seeds that are on top and weeds in any seed needs the uh, sun to be able to germinate so you want to make sure you, you control that and that's one of the things they found out they have a lot less weeds. Um, not having as many weeds you'll also find out when we talk about fertilizers that that's better too because you're not putting as much synthetic things on the land which we found out isn't that good. Here you can see when they turn it um, that they have a 
this area right in here uh, that I circled with my pointer, that um, it's a little bit higher, and that's the ridge it leaves. There's one across the second one here. How those are created is up here is where the discs are. It's just a, a curved piece of metal that's about um, a foot and a half wide, and that's what actually goes into the ground. They have a hydraulics on it, and they are able to go into the ground that far. Uh, the farmer can lift it by a control he has on his tractor. Uh, talking about synthetic fertilizers. Um, the synthetic fertilizers came about around the time that they ended the Second World War, and it was um, basically because we were farming, we weren't, they needed to, they always want to increase production, and that was a way in which the fertilizer, of course, um, we all use it on, you know, house plants we have, like um, miracle Grow. And it helps the plant grow. It provides nutrients. It needs specifically nitrogen that will help that plant uh, do better. Most farm crops, nitrogen is um, the fertilizer they want to put on there to make it grow better. But one of the problems that they found out um, that they didn't know right in the beginning was that those synthetic fertilizers don't make the soil vitality any better. In other words, the nutrients in the soil that stay there they're, they found out that it uses it right away and then there's nothing there. So basically the soil is getting worse and worse every year. The other thing is in a normal soil there are micronutrients and micronutrients aren't in as large a supply as the macronutrients that are out there and nitrogen happens to be one of the macronutrients. Um, but basically there are things that help a plant get stronger, they help a plant flower better. Um, those types of things, and there's things like boron that um, are some of the um, micronutrients, but there's total of all nutrients, there's 17 different ones, and in a uh, unit that's going to follow, we'll get into um, all of the macro and micronutrients, so that'll make a lot more sense then. Um, also what happens is that by putting in the fertilizers, and it's not a total result of that, but because you aren't building the soil and the vitality isn't as good, it's going to become more compressed over time because it's taking out some of those nutrients um, and it's going to not be real good for the soil. Um, one of the other things they're found out is all the nitrogens we put on the um, on the land when we're doing this, there's times that a lot of that fertilizer will leach out. That means it leaves it without doing the desired effect that you want with the fertilizer. And basically what happens is it goes from um, the farm field into ditches, then to streams, then to rivers, and it eventually gets down to the Gulf of Mexico. And basically what happens on that is that's where all of the, uh, basically it's killing the coral reefs and stuff um, and all the uh, all the plants and animals that are at the end of the Gulf of Mexico. Um, and, it, and this happens all over the world, it's just not in the Gulf of Mexico. Um, but basically what we're finding out is that we're really putting too much on because if it doesn't need it, it just runs off. The other thing is if you put it on at the wrong time, uh, if it rains, sometimes rain will make it wash away um, if the water's you know running off the field real quickly. Um, here's an example of a farmer applying fertilizer, and in this case, he's applying nitrogen, and specifically, it's called anhydrous ammonia. Um, it's a it's a gaseous um, liquid gas that basically, if you breathed it, um, you would probably not be here anymore. Uh, it's very dangerous. Um, but basically, what you see, and, and it's a good example here. If you look at between the, this is an example of corn. Uh, if you look between it, there's a residue from the corn of last year. Uh, one of the things, and we'll, we'll get into this in more detail as we go through the course, but that's one of the problems they have, that some of the um, crops we put in will put some nutrients back into the soil. Corn's not one of those. It actually just takes nutrients, especially nitrogen, and that's what's making the vitality of the soils uh, less and less all the time. And we'll talk in ways we can make that better too. Here's an example of um, the, the prior uh, slide showed you were just applying nitrogen, you apply it everywhere, okay? 
it's really only needed where the plant is, but there's not an effective way we can really do that without putting it on the whole field. Here is an example of, it wouldn't so much be a farmer's not gonna be out there doing this, but it just shows that you can use a selective weed killer, even if you spray it on the whole field. But what's good about this is it's only gonna kill the uh, intended plants you want. So if you're out in a, just say a grass yard, um, you can spray a weed killer, a selective weed killer, and it's not going to kill the grass, it's just going to kill um, the weed that you want. It's the same in a, a farm field. They can put in selective uh, herbicides, they call it, and it doesn't kill the plants, it only kills the weeds that are there. Um, for synthetic fertilizers, um, in, in some ways, that it's it's become something, especially with corn, that if you don't use it, you're not going to get the crop yield that you want. And and one of the ways that they've made it, they, they've used genetics to be able to produce corn that, that will give you uh, a yield that you like. Back in the 40s and 50s, they used to get about 40 to 45 um, bushels of corn for an acre of land. Right now, they're exceeding 300 bushels of corn per acre. So you can see that they've really, really increased the amount of uh, yield that you can get, which means you get more yield, which means you get more money, and everyone loves it. Part of the problem is, is you needed a lot of nitrogen to do that. And because you put more nitrogen, there's more runoff, so you have a big issue with that. So that's some of the stuff that we're going to start talking about. What can we do to become more sustainable, which you'll see is a huge word as we go through this class. Um, irrigation will also aggravate the problem. We talked earlier, when you get too much rain, um, you, you can have an issue with it. But but with that is, is that it'll make it run off a little bit more. You just have to be careful with that. Irrigation isn't in most farms. It's usually only in vegetable farms. Um, so if you're raising stuff like potatoes or pumpkins or, you know, peas or, you know, things you buy in the store like that, as opposed to corn and um, soybeans, which are your byproduct, you use, they create many different products, but they, you don't eat that corn directly. Um, also, irrigation aggravates a problem that it adds salts to the soil, and too much salt is not good for soil either, and it doesn't necessarily go away. Salt tends to stay. It doesn't tend to... Um, leave the area and that could be a problem and certainly is a problem in some of the areas that do irrigation. Um, fertilizers are becoming tremendously expensive. Um, they didn't used to be very expensive but even the fertilizer you buy for your yard you know 10 years ago used to be half the cost of what it is today so that's really made a big difference. Um, and then I talked earlier the, the second to the last point there is corn would not produce what it does. If you didn't fertilize it, you'd probably get about a third the amount that you get currently. So you get about 100 bushels an acre as opposed to 300. And like we said, when we do that, it doesn't address that long-term vitality of the soil because what happens is it um, just uses everything that's there and no nutrients are added. And that's become a huge problem. Okay. Um, also, besides doing the nitrogens, there's also chemicals that we use for pest and weed control. Um, what they try to control when they use these chemicals are diseases that you might get on crops, um, insect infestations, um, and there's also the weeds you can get. Um, what we do is one of the reasons we put the herbicides, pesticides, or fungicides on, and herbicides are for the crops. Pesticides are things for like grasshoppers, boll weevils, that type of stuff, the insects. And fungicides are for the diseases um, that you might get. And it varies by crop, and we'll talk a little bit about that as we get into the succeeding uh, chapters of uh, this course. Um, some of the issues we have with the pest and weed control is that it is a synthetic item so it's not something that's natural and what we're finding is is not having natural things it isn't as good as we thought it was but what happens is over time 
we have found that the effectiveness of that chemical decreases. In other words, it isn't doing the same as it did because the insects and diseases are learning from they're going to get killed with, let's say, something like um, DDT was a perfect example. It killed everything. But what we also found with that is over time that it affected the environment too. So for the, what, one of the things that DDT um, affected tremendously were birds of prey. So the big thing everyone will remember, basically it's hawks and eagles are birds of prey, two of the big uh, species that are out there. And we almost lost all of the eagles because what happened is the shell of the egg got thinner and thinner and thinner because of DDT. And basically when the mother or father eagle sat on the eggs, they broke because they weighed too much. Um, so now that we got rid of DDT in, I believe it was the 70s, um, the eagles are making a comeback, as everyone knows. Um, but one of the issues with it is, is that DDT was one of those chemicals that we thought you put it on and did its job and killed everything, and then it went away. Uh, guess what? That's not true. The DDT is still around, and we haven't had it on in, what, 40 years? They haven't applied any, and it's still in soil. So we're finding out that some of the stuff we're doing isn't so good, and one of the things we'll learn in this class is we really, really need to consider getting away from synthetic as much as we can, if not totally. Um, <clears throat> here's just an example of irrigation, and <clears throat> excuse me, here's a crop of, it looks like corn or potatoes, it's hard to tell, it's so small. Um, but basically they just have those long units and they have sprayers hanging off. The, the big uh, silver part that you see up here is how the water goes across and that goes all the way down there. Um, the wheels on it are so that they can have a motor. We don't see it in this picture, but it actually swings around on a pendulum and it can go across that whole field. And what you see here is those lines that are there is where the tires go and it actually uh, ruins some of the crops, but <coughs> it's still... Um, does a good job watering, and because you're watering, it's in areas they probably don't have enough rain, but things like corn and soybeans don't need to have rain. Generally, the rain that you have in an area is enough, but when you get crops like the veggies, you really, really need to have irrigation because they need more, a lot more water. Okay, and now we're going to start looking at um, how changes have started happening over time. Um, in terms of plants and animals is how we're going to look at this, I mean, changes we've had in that. They've had new hybrids and varieties of crops. Every year they come out with one of the ways we're getting higher and higher yields or the amount of crops we're pulling out of a field each year is they come out with new hybrids that will grow better in either a specific area, a specific environment, um, or for a specific purpose. Um, we've all heard the, the term GMO. Um, how they've accomplished this is they've done the genetically modified organism is what GMO stands for, and that's how they've come up with the new varieties. Basically, when back in the olden days, I guess I'll say, they used to have what they called open pollinated crops, and that was crops that basically if you took, like say, an ear of corn and saved the corn, the next spring you could plant that corn and you'd get the same crop again. Well, they did that, you know, 40, 45 bushel an acre, and that wasn't enough. It wouldn't get any more no matter what they did. So they started, uh, geneticists started coming up with ways that they could produce more uh, corn. Uh, so you had larger uh, cobs of corn, ears of corn. Um, but when they did that, what they're finding out now is that that GMO type stuff is starting to show up in the animals that are um, eating it. It's showing up in the people that are eating the meat from the animals that are eating the GMO corn. So we're not sure yet um, what that means totally, if it's good or bad, but we're beginning to believe that perhaps the GMO might not have been the right thing, and we might have to look at coming up with new hybrids um, that maybe aren't as genetically altered or certainly do studies to find out whether or not it's affecting us in a good or a bad way, or animals too. Um, 
in, in terms of some of the stuff, there are new crossbreeds of animals, and everyone's heard about the clone sheep and the clone cattle, the, you know, the, the Betty, the, you know, Barney, whatever the names of these animals are. England tends to be a place that uh, has a lot of, they've come up with a lot of cloned animals. Um, basically, what they're trying to do when they do either a cloned animal or a crossbreed is to pass on the desirable traits from one let's say a cow to the next one. So in other words, if there's qualities about that cow, it has too much fat, it, it, it doesn't walk very well, um, it has leaner um, meat, uh, all those types of things that they're going to pass just those one trace that they like onto it. Another thing is if you had dairy cattle, that they would produce more milk is, is, the, is the largest thing. Or you produce a chicken that'll produce uh, more meat or it'll lay more eggs, that type of thing. Um, in order to do this though, um, they, they, what they do is they try to do these things and then they'll use drugs and medicines in order to help in that development. Um, they aren't real sure at this point, and it's becoming more and more of a debate on whether or not these, this evolution has been a great thing or it's been a bad thing. And it's, it's I suppose, like anything, you, uh, you're going to have people that are on both sides of the fence. But time will tell on that. Uh, here's an example of one of the things that in the, in the what used to always happen is here was an example where you have cattle feed lots, okay? You're in a pasture on individual farms. And here's an example where um, there's not too many cattle here, but in the cattle feedlots, there are thousands and thousands of cows, and it's that um, corporate farming. And then it's, it's, in their opinion, much cheaper to do that. But we've had some issues with um, when we've done that, when you look at the cattle feedlots, you see how close they are together. When the animals don't have as much room to roam, one of the issues that they have is there's more pollution because they're generally not out on farms. They're usually on the edge of town and they have nowhere to uh, take the animal waste. And generally they just keep piling it up and piling it up. Whereas when it was on the old farm, the individual family farms, they used to take the um, animal waste and spread it on the fields and use that as fertilizer, that nitrogen. Um, the other thing is when you have animals in a small area, they're more prone to disease. So therefore, you had to start using antibiotics that they didn't used to have to use as much when they were out on the individual farms to try to control the different um, diseases that they might get. Um, in terms of looking at these changes that we're seeing, that single family farms are going away at an alarming rate. And a lot of, it used to be that the oldest son would always take over um, the family farm when dad decided to retire. And dad and grandpa might help out on the farm, but the son eventually had it, the oldest one, and that's generally what happened. Today, it's pretty much all of the children are leaving the farm, and when dad retires, they're selling the farm, and it's becoming larger and larger and larger and more corporately owned, um, and how stuff is done is totally based on the kind of money you make not necessarily what's good for the environment. Um, it's become also that because the um, corporate has kind of taken over and made the large uh, lots for raising cattle, that it isn't cost effective to raise cows or pigs as much as it used to be. They aren't making as much. Uh, in terms of dairy farmers, they have to pick up the milk every day um, and when you had the 30, 40 cows, those type of farms are pretty much going away and they're, you know, setting farms up with two, three, four, five thousand 5,000 dairy cows that they're uh, milking on a 24-hour operation. So it's become tremendously different um, in, in, in what's happening. Um, the last point there is most crops are dependent on many factors. And you need ideal settings in order for them to survive. In other words, that they're becoming more and more specialized in what they're able to do and how they produce. But what happens is if you get out of that um, environment that was ideal, you might not get the kind of uh, yield that you want to get. So we've had 
so they're starting to have some issues with that that they're trying to address. Uh, and then just a little bit, a few slides to talk about some of the limitations that we have currently, which we've basically been talking about the whole way through. Um, what we're finding out is that our model is not very sustainable, which means that over time, it isn't going to let you keep going on and on and on. We're going to have to keep making changes, add more fertilizer, you know, add more pesticides or herbicides or come up with new ones because what we have isn't regenerating what we need to have. A good example is the uh, nutrients in the soil, that because we don't have that, it's not going to let us continue on the way we're going. Eventually, we're going to have to change that. Um, another thing is populations are growing, cities are getting bigger, so every year the amount of land that we farm is decreasing. Um, and if you decrease the land, the only way that you're going to produce enough food for everybody is to increase the yield of what you're growing. Um, population growth of the world is out of control. They're saying, uh, predictions are out there that by the year 2050, that if population continues to grow like it is right now, they won't have enough food to feed the world. We'll have massive starvation. Um, in the oceans, um, the ecosystems there are declining over time. One of the problems is all the fertilizers and pesticides and herbicides are getting to the oceans and it's starting to filter in and affect the different uh, flora and fauna that are out there. Um, and it's, it's affecting, you know, what we're going to have. The other thing they're having is in some areas, especially like on the East Coast where they do a lot of uh, uh, fishing, uh, where the boats go out and get all the different fish that are out there. And then in the uh, Gulf of Mexico, they get all the, um, all the crabs and the crabs aren't, aren't down there, they're out east. But um, the shrimp and those types of uh, uh, animals, that they're overfishing now. Uh, another problem we are is where coral reefs are dying due to that fertilizer population. Um, they aren't, <coughs> excuse me, they aren't sure, but they believe that the GMO genetics um, are starting to cause pollution also. And that's just in the infancy of looking at that, so we'll learn more as time goes on of that. Um, another issue we have is the amount of water we have, the fresh water, um, you can't use salt water from the oceans, which there's a ton of. You have to use fresh water, so that's either comes from a well, the aquifers in the ground, or from lakes and ponds. And what we're using is increasing and increasing at an alarming rate, certainly faster than it's being replenished in those aquifers, lakes, and ponds. Um, also, animal feedlots are increasing in size, so the pollution we have, the amount of uh, uh, medicines that we have to give the animals and that is increasing. So that's all gonna affect our health uh, as humans and things we wanna try to, to uh, reduce that. Um, what we're also learning is that there's residues from the fertilizers, pesticides, herbicides, and insecticides, which um, we use. And what we need to do is, because it leaches out into the uh, water tables, into the streams, ponds, and rivers, we need to reduce that um, also, the, uh, uh, the level of acid in the ocean is increasing at a higher rate. In other words, it's taking the oxygen out that it has, and it's destroying the coral, coral reefs and mollusks in many areas, which um, they don't totally understand all of those things, but they do know that everything around it is affected by those coral reefs decre decreasing in size. And coral reefs are live uh, organisms, and they're dying at an alarming rate all over the world. Okay, um, <clears throat> some of the limitations we have for soil degradation and we're using the fertilizer. What we're finding out, it's just taking the nutrients out. Um, what it also is doing is, they call it, their nutrients are bound up. In other words, the makeup of the soil is changing so that the nutrients that, that are there are in a state that they aren't allowed to be used. In other words, the soil's keeping them and not letting the crops use them. So what's happening with that? That means that you're going to get less of a uh, crop yield. Um, one of the things they really believe to become sustainable is that you have to get rid of the monocropping. What monocropping is, is that you're putting the same type of plant in year after year after year after year. 
Um, it used to be over time that um, every third or fourth year they used to rest the land and how you used to rest the land is put in something like wheat or oats or just don't put anything in and put in some type of cover crop was another possibility and that put nitrogen back in the soils. Those type of plants would put nitrogen back in and it used to be that they one year they'd put soybeans, the next year they put corn, the next year they um, put in wheat and then they go through that same cycle again and that would add the nitrogen back into the soil which was good because we don't do that anymore and we're just putting on the synthetic um, fertilizer nitrogen um, it's not it's making the soil worse and worse and worse as we go over time um, other problem is in the vegetable fields we're over watering and that's promoting that pollution by salinization which is too much salt in the soil and then um, we're also overgrazing the pastures. And basically what that is, you're putting too many animals in a small area for the ones that are grazing, and they eat up all of the uh, crop or the grasses that are there. And therefore, it's more expensive to feed them. Um, there's more disease that will come because it's all dirt. Uh, the wind will get the erosion issues. So there's all kinds of things that come into play um, when you're doing that. This is a list of all the attributions, uh, all the pictures we had in here and where they're at. So I'll leave this up for a little bit so you can see that.